kjære alle sammen. Mitt navn er Tine Kjær, og jeg er så heldig å få være direktør for skjønnlitteratur her på huset. Og jeg har den store gleden av å få ønske dere alle velkommen til Kaplendams Feel Good Fest. Yay! Det er vår i Norge. Det er lyst om morgenen, og det er lyst om kvelden. Ellers er alt ved det samme. De forede vinterstøvelettene er mer slitt enn da de ble tatt i bruk i november. Ullgenserne, skjerfene og lune våre, de har sett bedre dager. Men de varmer fortsatt mot isende vind og djevelsk sludd. Og det er godt at det finnes allværsjakker i verden å tre utenpå laget av ull når vi uforferdet kjemper oss gjennom vårkulla. Men i minste så er det lyst, og i det minste kan vi være inne, sammen. Kaplen Dams Feel Good Fest er en fest å varme seg på. Gjennom disse to ettermiddagene og kveldene så ønsker vi å feire de virkelig gode fortellingene. Forfatterne som skriver dem, og leserne som elsker dem. Vi ønsker at du som publikummer skal bruke så lite tid som overhodet mulig på logistikk. Bruksanvisningen for disse to dagene og kveldene er derfor forbløffende enkel. Vær her på forlaget i ettermiddag, det har veldig mange skjønt, og bli utover kvelden. Du kommer garantert til å møte din favorittforfatter, og bli kjent med din nye favorittforfatter. Og mest sannsynlig så treffer du en ny lesevenn som introduserer deg for enda et nytt favorittforfatterskap. Og så er du i gang. Alle bøkene får du kjøpt her i Halvbroren, og hvis du er skikkelig snill og grei, så får du sikkert din gamle eller nye favorittforfatter til å signere boka. Så er det et par praktiske ting. Det er nødutgang der. Også er det toaletter ned trappene gjennom forlagsrestauranten Seierherrene og helt innerst. Det er veldig stor interesse for Kaplen Dams Feel Good Fest. Vi håper å få plass til alle hele tiden. Men vi ber om forståelse for at vi må forholde oss til maks antall gjester. Og dette på grunn av brannvernerestriksjoner, det skjønner dere sikkert. Før jeg gir ordet til våre fantastiske programledere Kari Birkeland og Sara Natasha Melby, og ikke minst prologør Else Koss Furuset heter det prologør. Ja, jeg vet, men hvis det heter prologør, vi sier at det gjør det. Men da vil jeg benytte muligheten til å ønske alle våre kjære forfattere velkommen. Tusen, tusen, tusen takk til dere for at dere så velvillig og entusiastisk stiller opp for oss lesere som er så glad i dere. And a special heartfelt welcome to you, Tracy Rees, Bonnegames and Harry Whittaker. You fought your way to Norway through the ice-cold sleet and chaos at Oslo airport yesterday. Thank you for coming all the way to join us at Kaplendam's Feel Good Fest. Unfortunately, John Boyne and Marion Keyes got ill and could not make it here, but we really hope to see them here next year. Nok en gang, velkommen inn i varmen til magiske møter med fortellingene og forfatterne som berører. Da har jeg gleden av å gi ordet til selveste Else Koss Furuset, som du også kan se på festkveld her i kveld. Tusen takk for meg, og ha det gøy da! Der skal vi være, ja, woo! Det var så deilig, jeg tenkte, du var liksom ferdig for seg. Klokka er bare halv fire, men du er i party. Få høre en gang til, woo! Woo! Ja, tusen takk, kjær. Det var en nydelig introduksjon til hele festivalen. Jeg fikk sånn en mai-følelse, ja. Rett og slett. Og så, I'm sorry I'm not going to speak English, because I can't speak English. Men jeg er altså da prologør. Nå tenker dere hva faderen er det. Det tenker jeg også, hva er prologør? Men jeg kan ikke si det engang, men jeg er prologør. 
Eh, og det er rett og slett at jeg er eh, en liten bonus. Jeg er på en måte hun som spør kaffe eller ti før det virkelige eh, hovedrettene kommer etterpå. Så jeg er en liten bøttler her i dag. Og det er fordi jeg er eh, på Kappelen eh, Damme forlag. Og jeg er aldri klar å bli ferdig med en bok. Eh, så da er jeg på ulike arrangementer innimellom eh, for å få mindre kjeft. Og også fordi jeg er veldig glad i feelgood-sangeren. Eh, og... Eh, Knut Gølvig, som står i hjørnet der. Sølreven. Eh, applaus for han. Ja, jeg kan klappe han også. Når det er, eh, når det er Filgudsfestival, så kan vi se si at det er en veldig god sveis du har fortsatt her. Vi ser jo at... Ja, nei, du, selv om du er... Ja, det er blond, ja. Ja, ja. Lenge lever livsløgn. Ja. Men vi ser at selv om det er snø på taket, så er det fil i peisen. Ja, der skal vi ligge, folkens. Eh, og eh, Gølvild, eh, Gølvild eh, sendte meg mail. Vil du være med? Ja, sa jeg. Og så svarte jeg aldri på hva tema skulle være. Så Gølvild har selv funnet på tema som jeg skal snakke om, og det er Love is in the air. Ja, sier du. Jeg tenker nei. Det er jo søren ikke noe kjærlighet i lufta. Ja, fuck you, Gølvild, tenkte jeg. Love is in the air. Jeg har ikke noe love i, in the air, altså er det romantisk laget, men jeg kjenner jo kjærligheten, i hvert fall av deg som nikker veldig foran der. Mm -hmm. Jeg kjenner jo kjærligheten i rommet her. Eh, så tenkte jeg, hvem er det som er her? Alle dere, eh, hovedsakelige damer, er det noen mann, menn her? Ja, åh, yes, applaus for deg! Hva heter du for noe? Alf, applaus for Alf! Nei, litt mer da, Alf! Ja, det er veldig, veldig hyggelig å se deg, Alf. Eh, og men jeg har, tror noe annet av dere andre og Alf. Jeg tror dere har noe til felles. Eh, og jeg, dette er en fordom jeg har. At dere eh, liker å lese bøker med kjærlighet. Om kjærlighet. Kanskje savner noe kjærlighet i livet. Yes. Er det lov til å si det? Yes! Yes! yes. Du savner masse kjærlighet. Hva er telefonnummeret ditt? Ja. Det er henne her som er ganske klar. Det blir en deilig kveld. Hva heter, hva heter, du, hva heter du for noe? Hege savner kjærlighet. Jeg skal ikke jeg snakke på vegne av andre enn Hege og meg selv. Men vi savner kjærlighet, og heldigvis finnes jo kjærlighet i bøkene. Men nå skal dere få høre om litt om kjærlighet eh, i det virkelige liv. Og det er en som jeg har notert her eh, på mobilen, for det er en sånn type jeg er. Men det er en solskinnshistorie om kjærligheten her kalt. Og jeg synes, og det er ironisk ment, og jeg synes innimellom det er viktig å fortelle litt triste historiene. Eh, for det blir man glad av, for de kan man tenke, heldigvis var det ikke i dag. Eh, det var for mange måneder siden, og i dag skal jeg fortelle om noe som skjedde meg for mange måneder siden. Eh, og hvis du kan velge sjanger, så kan vi kalle det kanskje en litt mørk, Bridget Jones. Og hensikten med å fortelle dette her, er at når du hører om andres liv som går litt skjeis, så kan du se på ditt eget liv, så kan du tenke, søderen, så bra jeg har det da. Jeg eh, er på Tinder, altså en, eh, en matchmaking-app. Eh, nå nikker du smiler nå, for nå vet du hva Tinder er. Vet du hva Tinder er? Yes. Yes. Hege, vet du veldig godt hva det er? Herregud, du skal opp på scenen etterpå. Eh, det er jo på en måte en uh, ungdomsversjon av Match.com, eh, eller Sukker. Eh, og du skal rett og slett finne eh, kjærligheten. Og jeg har vært der i 5-6 år. Og jeg har sikkert sveipet høyre på 2000 menn. Få treff på to cirka. Og for noen måneder siden så fikk jeg treff. Og ut fra bildene på, profil, på, på profilen så var det en veldig eh, kjekk mann, ikke litt kjekk. Altså ordentlig kjekk. Ordentlig kjekk mann. Glenn Hugh Grant, vi snakker Ryan Gosling. Han var eh, for godt til å være sann. For god til å være sann. Jeg tenkte, ja, ja, jeg får kjøre på. Eh, og når det er på treff, så blir man jo veldig glad når det faktisk skjer. Men samtidig så er jeg litt skadet av dårlig selvtillit, eh, som mange har, på kjekke og kjærestefronten. Så jeg tenkte, hm, hva er det som er gærent her? Han der kan umulig synes at akkurat jeg kan være noe for han. Men så glemte jeg skepsisen. Vi begynte å chatte, og det var god stemning. Det var lett og ledig tone. Det var både indelig og ironisk. Og han sa masse fint til meg. Eh, jeg virket smart, og jeg var sjarmerende, og, og masse annet sånt som jeg ble kjempeglad. Det var ikke én nud i det hele tatt. Han sendte ikke en eneste oberg inn. Det er et annet Uh, ord for penis, Hege. Du jobber på kondomeriet, ja. Du har gjort det, ja. 
Eger jobber på kondomeriet, det forklarer jo så mye. Det er, ja, tidligere i liv, ja. Tidligere i liv, ja. Jeg følte virkelig at han eh, så mig da, og hvem jeg var bak all tullball. Det var en veldig god kjemi. Ja, det var, jeg er liksom uvann på situasjonen, så jeg ble nesten litt uvel. Eh, men hjertet slo litt fortere hver gang jeg tenkte på han, og det ga seg liksom ikke. Og da tenkte jeg, han må jeg faktisk møte. Og det ville heldigvis han også, det jeg skrev med Catslock her. Det er en sånn forfatter i gåstein. Han ville heldigvis også møte meg. Og så avtalte vi å møtes på kafé rett ved der jeg bor. Laundromat på Bislett. Bergsinskatte 2 av min adresse. Hvis noen andre vil møte meg, for det gikk ut heldigvis ikke så veldig godt. Jeg brukte veldig lang tid på å finne ut av hva jeg skulle ha på meg. Jeg ringte venninne på FaceTime. Jeg var egentlig ganske fornøyd når jeg så meg speil. Jeg tenkte, vet du hva, Else, faen eller, kunne det vært bedre, men det kunne også vært verre. Er ikke dette en ganske søt jente da? Kvinne en og føl, to og føl, beklager. Og så møttes vi da, og han var sønner av meg enda kjekkere enn på bildene. Dritkjekk. Og da er mitt instinkt. Her må det være noe kødd. Jeg vet at det er veldig dumt og selvopptatt på en måte å tenke sånn, men alarmklokkene begynte å ringe. Uh, og vi satt og pratet, og så slutt som at jeg spørre han, så sa jeg, du, det er ikke skjult kamera? Og så lo han godt, og så sa han, nei, det er jo ikke det, men så lo vi det begge to, og herregud, så dum du har blitt, og du har jobbet for mye med TV og alt mulig, det er ikke skjult kamera? Og etter hvert pratet vi mer, og det ble bare hyggelig, hyggeligere. Han snakket om sin familie, og faren et geir, og mora et unn, og det var god stemning. Altså, jeg ble jo ikke forelsket, jeg er jo ikke helt idiot heller. Men innimellom all den litt tullete og fine praten, så tenkte jeg, åh, et liv med han ville vært veldig fint. En nydelig fyr. Og dere vet, på sånne første dater, det er alltid spennende hvordan en sånn kveld skal rundes av. Og jeg hadde jo håpet om litt av hvert, jeg. Ikke Bergsinskatte 2, men dere vet. Jeg hadde kanskje puls på, ja, 130, jeg har ikke sånn pulsklokke, ja, men er det normalt, eller? 118, Alf, hvor mye puls har du? 130, der du, da går det, kjenner du at det klokk... Ja, det begynner å bruse i blodet, liksom. Og så gikk vi ut på kaféen, da, og så gjentok jeg at jeg syntes det var veldig hyggelig å gjentak på tull, at jeg sorry, og beklager at jeg trodde det med skjult kamera, så dum jeg var, da. Og så lo han seg, ja, det var dumt, og så sa han, ja, men jeg har nå en liten innrømmelse, da. Det er ikke skjult kamera, men det er veddemål. Og øh, veddemål, sa jeg. Ja, veddemål, sa han. Da ble jeg veldig forvirret. Vedde man om hva da? Jo, jeg får eh, 10 000 kroner hvis du kysser meg. Og da var det akkurat som en sånn British Jones film hvor alt stoppet opp. En av de vonde, vonde scener i British Jones hvor du tenker all by myself. Hvor hun skraper muggen av osten og tenker til helvete. Bare verre enn British Jones hvor hun gikk og prøvde alltid å gå ned i vekt selv om hun veide 62 kilo. Og så stod jeg og tenkte at det eneste du kan gjøre nå, Else, det er å ikke begynne å gråte. Så da bøyde jeg meg fram mot han og lærte det jeg har lært på alle selvhjelpsseminarer. Jeg har gått mange år i terapi også. Så kysset jeg ham. Ikke så veldig lenge, for jeg ville ikke være billig heller. Men jeg ville ikke begynne å grine. Tenkte jeg, da vant jeg, han fikk cash, og jeg begynte ikke å gråte. Dette her er ikke så veldig sterk kjærlighetshistorie, og senere i dag skal dere få høre fra forfattere som har ekte forfattere, og ikke bare TV-folk. Eh, men jeg vil si det kunne gått bedre, men det kunne også gått mye verre. Fordi det aller viktigste som jeg har lært da, er at du faktisk må prøve om du ikke elsker deg selv, i hvert fall være litt fornøyd med deg selv. Og akkurat det jeg gikk hjem for å spise Big Mac hjemme alene i Bergsiskasse 2, så tenkte jeg, faen heller, nå ga jeg han en god historie. Dette her minner oss om at hvis det går til helvete i ditt liv, så har du faktisk bøkene. Og der har du bedre historier hvor det ikke er veddemål, men faktisk du også finner kjærligheten. Jeg håper dere finner kjærligheten her i kveld. Hvis ikke dere liker forfatterne, så husk at Hege sitter foran her. Og så sier jeg bare, god festival! Var det en prolog?
tusen, tusen takk til fantastiske Else og kjære alle sammen. Hjertelig velkommen til Kappelendams Feelgood-fest. Så utrolig stas at så mange er her en onsdag ettermiddag. Helt nydelig. Jeg heter Kari Birkland, og det er veldig hyggelig for meg å lede noen av samtalene utover kvelden i dag og i morgen sammen med Sara Natasha, som er også programleder. Spesielt hyggelig er det på grunn av de vi skal samtale med. Den første i kveld, eller i ettermiddag, er den britiske stjerneforfatteren Tracy Rees. Hun slo igjennom med et brak i 2015 med boken Mysterie Amy Snow. Og selveste Lucinda Riley utpekte henne som en av de mest lovende nye stemmene innen historisk drama. Og siden så har det blitt veldig mange bestsellere, oversatt til en rekke språk. Nå er hun her og er aktuell med den siste boken som er oversatt til norsk, som heter Skandalen. Så gi henne en stor applaus. Please welcome Tracy Rees. Hello. Nice to meet you. You can sit there. So nice to have you here, Tracy. It's lovely to be here. And um, you came yesterday? No, Monday. It was Monday. Oh, lucky. Because yes. yesterday was like a January grey snowing day. Yes, yes. Um, I thought maybe we should start with uh, your own story, the way you became a successful writer, because it's almost like a novel in <laughs> itself. Because you won a yeah. competition for a best-selling, yes. uh, a bestseller competition. Uh, could you tell us about what happened? Sure, yes. So um, I'd always wanted to be a writer all my life since I was a tiny little girl. And um, basically all the way through school and university, people kept telling me, no, 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 you can't make money out of that, you can't make a living, you must have a proper job and keep writing as a hobby. Um, and so that's what I did. And then I think I was 40, 41 before I realized that with the other careers that I'd had and enjoyed, I still wanted to write. That was what I really, really wanted to do. Mm. So um, I went to work as a waitress in a restaurant in York and um, I, I would do my waitressing shifts during the day and then write in the evening. And I wrote and I wrote and I sent work out to agents, to competitions, to literature festivals. And I had a short story published in a magazine in America and I, uh, I, I was placed in a couple of poetry competitions. So little things were starting to happen. And then one of the competitions that I entered was the Richard and Judy Search for a Bestseller mm. competition. Um, Richard and Judy are very big in Britain in the, the book scene. And I knew it was going to be a huge, uh, a huge deal to enter this competition. I didn't honestly think I had any chance of winning it whatsoever. Mm. Um, but basically, you know, I had to give it a go. So I sent off the first 10,000 words of Amy Snow, and then I forgot about it. Mm. So for the next few months, I went back to, because I really, really didn't think I would, could possibly, you know, get anywhere with it. I then went back to writing another book uh, that I was enjoying at the time. And uh, then a couple of months later, I had an email from Richard and Judy, and I thought, well, that's very nice of them to write to yeah. every single person to say yeah. thank you for, for entering. And of course, they were writing to say that I was on the short list of seven people. Mm. So I just, I couldn't believe it. And then they said, um, so now you have three months to submit your complete manuscript. And at that point, I still only had 10,000 words. So <laughs> three <laughs> months, so just three months. Yeah. So I just wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote because I knew it was going to be the best chance I would ever have. Mm. And um, so I, I left my waitressing job and um, I went home and um, my bank account was <laughs> going down and down. And I thought, you know, if this doesn't work out, then I'll have to do something quite drastic. Mm. But then I won it. Um, Amazing. Which, yeah, still to this day, I, I can't quite believe it. 
and I remember the phone call. Yeah. It was a phone call, yeah. yeah, because I was wondering if it was a mail or... Do you remember where you were sitting or what you were doing when you received the phone call? Yeah, I was actually, I was in my parents' house, so they like that because they got to know immediately. Yeah. And um, I just had a, f I had a feeling, it was an unknown number, and I, I just had a feeling it was actually a few days before they said they would announce it. Mm -hmm. But I had the feeling, and I, I ran upstairs into my old childhood bedroom and shut the door, uh -huh. and answered the phone, and... Um, uh, yes, it was. So it was my then editor at Quirkus Books, mm. um, Steph, phoning to say, "You won it. You won the competition." And yeah, I and since then the life has life has changed. Really. Completely, completely, completely. Yeah. Give her applause for that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, it's amazing because uh, you know, like you said, you didn't have your hopes up because mm. you had tried many times to, yeah. to and how do you how, how do you uh, when you get these refusals mm. when you when you send in your manuscript how does it affect you oh it's really hard and I mean this is just a part of the writing journey and everybody who is a writer or has tried to be a writer will, will know this because rejections are so common and most writers not all but most writers just get rejection after rejection after rejection mm. And I think part of what makes you a writer, makes you want to be a writer, mm. is having quite a sensitive nature, you know, being empathic, being mm. able to be sensitive to other people's feelings. And so to be a very, very sensitive person, doing something that you pour your heart into, mm. and to have people say, no, we don't want it, no, we don't mm. want it, it's, hard. Uh, it's really hard. Uh. So one of the things that I've, um, you know, obviously we learn and grow through life, one of the things that I've needed to develop is a thick skin. Mm. Uh, that that's not me naturally. It never was me, mm. but now it is mm. because otherwise I can't do mm. what I do. Mm. Yeah, you have to be. But you said yourself that you 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 worked as a waitress, and uh, I knew you worked uh, as uh, in publishing yeah. and as a counselor for people with cancer and their families. Yes. Uh, so you had you had different parts in your life, sure. and and uh, was it like you said it before that people said you can't live this is not living, you, you will not succeed, so you just had mm. this safety net, or? Yeah, very much mm. so. I think, I mean, I really, you know, I believed when people said you can't make money out of it, I, I believed them. Mm. And I was a bit crushed because it really was the only thing I had ever wanted to do. So yeah. <laughs> when I was close to graduating from university, all my friends were going and getting jobs at top law firms and goodness mm. knows what, you know, all the best hospitals. And I was still sitting there thinking, I just want to be a writer, mm. but I, I, I couldn't as mm. far as I was concerned. Mm. So I decided to apply for publishing because I kind of thought, I was very shy back then. I don't know what happened to that. <laughs> um, and I thought that it would be nice to have a job where I could just sit in an office in a corner and, and be left alone. Mm. Um, uh, but also because there was still this part of me thinking, but if, if mm. I write a book one day, it mm. would be good to see the other side. Mm. Um, but I ended up in medical publishing, as you said. So mm. I was publishing t uh, textbooks for doctors um, mm. about diabetes and <laughs> asthma. So it, it was very far from what I wanted to write. Not feel good. Um, not to feel good, <laughs> <laughs> no. But it did help me to understand the process. Mm. So that definitely played a part in, in you know, what's happened since. And then when I realized that I'd spent eight years sitting in an office, I didn't want to do that anymore. I retrained, mm. as, as you said, as a counselor. Mm. Um, and that has certainly fed into my writing as well. Mm. Yeah. But luckily for us, you succeeded and uh, mm. everything changed. And yeah. um, Yes, you have been very productive. How many books have you written since 2015? Um, ten published, and I've just finished my 11th. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's hard. That's hard work, huh? Yeah. 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 And uh, is it like I read an interview with you, or I heard you say maybe that it's like the stories whisper to you? Yeah. <laughs> and I was just wondering if it's like you hear voices in your head, or how do they? <laughs> how do they? How do they yes. come out? <laughs> yes, how I do, hear how do they whisper in my head. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I just um, so I uh, when I was a child, I'm I'm an only child. I don't have brothers and sisters. So when I was a child, I was always reading, always reading. So I think stories are just my way of being in the world. And mm. um, I've always had stories in my head. And since I've actually 
started writing and, and you know, now obviously I can allow the stories because it's my job, um, they just keep appearing all the time and mm. I just keep thinking, oh, I really want to write a story about blah, blah, blah. Mm. And then I scribble it down in my notebook and mm. carry on working so on it. So it's just on like the stories long. are queuing up? Yeah. Yeah, very much so. Okay. Sometimes they're really impatient. Okay. And, and they kind of say, come <laughs> on, when is it my turn? <laughs> so you, you never experienced like, oh, uh, well, I have to have an ID, my publisher is calling me, or no, it's just... No, I've, ne I've never had writer's block. That's mm. this lots of difficult things about... <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't jinx it. Yeah. <laughs> um, lots of difficult things about being a writer, but for me so far, that hasn't mm. happened. Mm. Yeah. Do you ever think uh, about what your life would have been now if you hadn't won this competition? Oh, or yeah, I mean, it, it's just, I, I can't imagine it now in a way. Mm. I mean, when I did win the competition and, and it all began, it seemed extraordinary. And in some ways it still does, even after 10 books, I'm still mm. really surprised and really gratified when somebody says, oh, I really enjoyed your book. Mm. 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 Oh, really? Mm. <laughs> um, so and yet, and yet, the alternative seems unimaginable now. Mm. I just, I don't know what I would be doing. Mm. Yeah, I'm unemployable now. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, <laughs> are you a person who just, you know, wakes up in the morning, have a tea or coffee, sit down at your desk, and just start working, or do you, you maybe don't need to be to have inspiration since you have all these stories in your head? But or do you have to sometimes, you know, uh, start like this, or is it? Yeah, a bit of everything really. Every day is different. Mm. Um, so, it, and I think it depends where I am in the book as well, how close I am mm. to my deadline, how um, how established the narrative is in my mind. Mm. But every day is different. But I always do start off with tea. That's very important. <laughs> um, and on a, on a really good day, I'll start off with a walk after that. I think it's really good to get out and have mm. fresh air and exercise. Um, and then come back and have a bit of breakfast and then start work. Mm. But some days, you know, if I know I've really just got to get mm. to a certain point today, um, some days I will just wake up, get my laptop, go back to bed. It's a very bad habit. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. very bad for your You're right in the bed? Yeah, sometimes. Okay. Mm. Yeah, sometimes I'll just sit there with my laptop and just, you know, I can get to 11 o'clock in the morning and I'm still there. And then mm. I realize I haven't had breakfast or <laughs> anything. Mm. Um, so it's just, yeah, different things, different days. Mm. Yeah. It's lovely, huh? Yeah. Not sitting in a desk uh, in an office in a job you yeah. didn't like. Yeah. 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 Lucky. Uh, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the book, which is um, no translated to Norwegian. It's called uh, Skandal. Yeah. The Elopement in, how do you say it in English? The Elopement. The Elopement. Yeah. And it's we are in London. It's uh, in the Queen Victoria era, and we meet. Um, you have three female main characters. It's mm. Pansy, Rowena, and uh, Olive. Mm. Very different women. Yeah. Uh, but how? Tell us a little bit about them. How would you describe these three? Oh, so um, I suppose the main narrative in Skandal mm. is um, Rowena's. Mm. And Rowena is a very wealthy woman. Um, and she's very spoiled. She's very, very beautiful. Everything's always come very easily to her. Mm. She's always had lots of attention. So she's very spoiled and quite superficial at the mm. beginning. And I was a bit surprised that she would that was the character that was insisting I write her. I thought, mm. wow, I thought, it, I thought it was that? Pansy who was maybe the one who ah, came first. No, no, no okay, it was Rowena. Rowena. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Okay. And I just thought, how am I going to like her, make her likable? Mm. Anyway, yeah. so that's the beginning of her story. And then Pansy is a maid in Rowena's house. So mm. she obviously gets the, the not so good side of Rowena. Mm. And she's a very, very bright young woman. But because of the way society was then for mm. women, she didn't have a lot of um, choices for career. Mm. So mm. she's ended up as a maid. And her own talents are sort of eroding. So she's become quite bitter. Mm. She's got a good heart. She's a bright girl, but she's very unsatisfied. Mm. So yeah, she's a bit bitter. And then there's Olive, um, who is also wealthy. So she's sort of the counterpart to Rowena and the mm. contrast to Rowena. She is also very wealthy and very privileged. 
but she uses that position in a very different way. She mm -hmm. runs a charitable foundation. She um, asserts her independence at every mm. turn. Mm. So uh, yes, they're, they're two very contrasting characters. And Pansy, as you said, uh, is a maid in this big uh, mansion in London, mm -hmm. the Blythe household. Mm. And it's very interesting the way you describe her because she really hates her job. And when she's doing her domestic chores, like cleaning the fireplace or whatever, she it's like she's really angry, but she has to hide it. And when I was reading it, it kind of reminded me of myself on a bad day, you know, when you're <laughs> yeah. emptying the dishwasher and you, you know you yeah. make very much noise and yeah. you just, you know, how you can be aggressive yeah. in your movements. Yeah. Uh, but you said she's very bright and she doesn't like her life, but what is she dreaming about? Well, at that, <laughs> at that point, um, all she's actually dreaming of is John Hobbs, mm. who is a footman in the Blythe household. So he's a fellow servant, and Pansy and John are good friends. Mm. But John is madly in love with Rowena. Mm. So, so, so that's <laughs> uh, like Elsa said in the beginning, love is never easy, uh, <laughs> not even in books. Uh, but let's talk a little bit more about Olive, because she... Uh, seems to me like a woman who doesn't bend for the expectations mm -hmm. and all the rules women uh, of that time should follow. Mm. Like she wants to have kids but doesn't want to marry, so she adopts them instead. Mm. How, how different is she, do you think, from, from the average women of that time? I think very different. And I think as a writer, it's quite um, it's a challenge to write a character who's different but convincing in a previous time because um, the, the temptation is just to make her like a modern woman mm. uh, and yeah, then yeah. That, that doesn't work so well. So she uh, she understands her world, I hope. she um, She's very much part of it. Mm. Um, but yeah, she just, she just has that spirit, which I think women people have had mm. forever. Yeah. Um, she just has that spirit of just, she doesn't want to be told what to do. And she sees the women around and the, the implications for them and how um, how society affects them, how it plays out every day. So she just keeps making the difficult decisions. Mm. It, and it's kind of like she's um, empowering the others because mm. she makes them, she asks them questions which maybe never have been asked before, mm. like what do you want or what about your brain or your soul or your yes. fantasy? So it's, um, she may be uh, make them think differently about the world. Yes, yeah. yes. I think she she likes to challenge other people as mm. well as as well as herself. Mm. Yeah. But um, there's always, uh, yeah, like you said, the the, the, the title is uh, Scandal, so it's a huge scandal, mm -hmm. uh, and Rowena shocks everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's always very difficult when you talk to writers because you know you don't want to reveal everything that happens, but. Mm. Maybe you can say something uh, about what what she's doing, or sure. yeah. Sorry. Um, so at the beginning of the book, Rowena is 23 or 24, and she's expected to marry. And her because she's getting old for those days, so mm. her her parents are encouraging her to choose a great husband. There's been speculation all through society about who she will eventually marry, and people are joking that she'll marry a prince or a duke. Mm. Um, but she actually doesn't really want to marry. She's happy in her world, in her childhood home. She's got her best friend, her nice dresses. Mm -hmm. She's not really that bothered. And she's waiting to feel something. And uh, it's not really a spoiler, because it's very near the beginning of the book. She mm. actually does meet a man who makes her feel. And um, he's the worst kind of guy for her. Mm. He's an artist's apprentice. He's Polish. He's uh, So he's a foreigner. Um, he's everything that her family would hate and never consider as a match for their daughter. Mm. But that's where her heart goes. So, mm. dot, 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 dot. Uh, mm. But we can say that this uh, she 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 finds herself in a situation where she kind of loses everything mm. around her and and and, uh, and becomes an outcast in her own family and in 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 society she knows. And how does this change her? Is it 
I mean, the experience she has, will, yeah. will she grow from it or? <laughs> <laughs> yes, always in my books, the yeah. characters grow. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I, I like the growth. Mm. Um, I think one of, one of the other characters, I don't know if it's Pansy or Olive at one point says, um, oh, ruination was the making of her. Mm. Um, so yeah, she does, it, her, her story arc is fun because it starts off here and then it gets worse mm. and then it gets worse and worse and worse. I kind of, you kind of like her better when she's yeah don't yeah. you think yeah definitely yeah, yeah. yeah. so maybe uh, yeah maybe we like people better when they you know not so yeah uh, on the top which she is in the beginning but um, what I think is also interesting is the way you describe um, you know the class system everything and mm. in this household it's very <laughs> funny because uh, they they call all the male servants for Henry yeah. because it's more convenient because it's difficult to remember the name uh, different <laughs> names of them so it's easier to say Henry to everybody mm. and um, kind of probably many of you have seen Downton Abbey and all these you know series and films with from big houses and big households mm. and it. Um, struck me it's, it's almost like small societies isn't it with the servants have their mm. small society with people have power there as well yeah. over others yes. and then it's the big house and yeah. um, why does this time this era interests you so much oh the the victorian era there's there's so much about it um i love i love the clothes i love the formal language i love the manners um, and then I think there's a sort of intrigue in levels of restriction that we don't really have anymore, even though obviously um, things aren't you know, completely straightforward and as we would want them these days, uh, there's still a lot of freedom that we have that wasn't possible then. And it just it intrigues me to think of so many people living within such tight strictures for so long. Mm. Um, because it was yeah. a very strict society at that time. Very How long was she um, the queen in England, Victoria? Um, 60 years. Mm. 60 years, which and is a long time. It's mm. a, lo a lot of change within that era. Mm. Um, yeah, and I mean, my research, it's just fascinating. You know what you said about calling all the footmen Henry because they couldn't be bothered to remember their real names. That was something I actually read about a real mm. family. Mm. And I just thought, oh, that's ridiculous. I've got to put mm. that in a book. And the other thing that I mentioned in there that just really tickled me was um, that because footmen were quite a decorative role, they were yeah. sort of meant to look good when visitors arrived, they actually did measure their calves. They measured around their legs um, to make sure they had shapely legs. So they, okay. they wouldn't employ men with skinny legs. So you were employed, you had to look good. You had to look good. Yeah, yeah. The women as well, or yeah. Yeah, mm. yeah. In, in this household, everybody had to look. Yeah. look. Yeah. It doesn't help Pansy much because she looks, how do you say it in English? Sullen. Yeah, sullen. Yeah. Sullen. yeah. Because she hates it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's uh, it's uh, also fascinating, I think, how you describe this friendship between these three women who, in the beginning, don't like each other. I mean, Pansy hates to bring tea to Rowena in the morning. Yeah. Rowena doesn't like Olive, etc. Mm. And then mm. uh, they unexpectedly help each other and 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 uh, and, and form a friendship. Mm. And um, uh, it's like me also in in Amy Snow and, and uh, many of your books. This is an important theme for you: the friendship between women. Yeah. Uh, why is that? <laughs> I think because I have a lot of amazing female friends and um, and I know how much that means to me and I know what it enables me to do. Um, mm. Because, you know, we know li life can be very difficult and um, friends for me are one of the most important things that counteract that difficulty and, and help us to, to do great things. Mm. Um, and also I think I, I really like the idea of um, people stretching themselves. As you say, that at the beginning they don't like each other. Um, so Olive is the last person Rowena would have um, chosen to turn to for help. And mm. Um, Rowena is the last person Pansy would ever have wanted to help. Mm. But when the chips are down and there's no one else, mm. um, I do you choose to be petty and, and leave that person in trouble? Or do you move beyond it and just do 
the right mm. the right thing, I guess. Yeah, yeah, um, and I, I really that really interests me. You know, the, the choices that people make in those moments. Mm. So yeah, it tells us about who we are. Mm. Uh, but I think um, some of the things you write about, like like this female friendship and love, of course, relationships, family dynamics. Are the same things we experience today? Yes. But but why why? And I know you you have written many historic novels, but also novels from our time or yeah. more contemporary yeah. time. But why is the historical setting so? Uh, how do you say it in English? Uh, so um, well suited for these themes? Oh, I think I think there's something about being placed in another time. It makes it look different. It makes it feel different. But actually, when we read it, as you say, y you realize it's all the same. And I think there's something quite resonant about understanding that people are people, uh, irrespective of time or place. And sure, the, the language might be different, the dress might be different, mm. uh, the specifics of society might be different, but people are people and mm. struggle with the same thing. I think for me, that's kind of a, a, a nice and important area to work in because it... Um, it, it, for me, it encourages a sense of togetherness, and mm. actually, we are all in this together. Um, mm. uh, uh, and h the human condition is—it's um, always the same. Mm. Yeah. This, it fascinates me. This uh, because I know you're very interested in history. You studied also. Um, his, um, let me language. No? Languages. Yeah. yeah. In in yeah. in a special time. Um, modern and medieval languages. Yeah, medieval languages. Yeah. That, that uh, you have to explain that. Uh, <laughs> how do you study medieval languages? Also, language from the medieval time, or yes, yeah. yes, basically. Yeah. yeah, but you don't go so far back. You do no, no, no. You wouldn't do that. Uh, well, <laughs> or is co book eleven? Book eleven. <laughs> so I'm, going to I'm not supposed to talk about it. Oh but yeah, um, okay. it, it it may be a little older. Okay, so we're going back in time, maybe. Maybe a little maybe, bit. Yeah. Maybe a little bit. Oh, <laughs> my time is uh, almost uh, <laughs> over. Um, Phew. <laughs> but if you could choose a time, mm. if you could just you know, move back <gasps> to a different time, uh, what would you choose? Where would I go to? Yeah, yeah. The 1960s. Okay. For the clothes and the music, <laughs> easy. <laughs> yeah. I thought I would you would say like, oh, the Queen Victoria time. <laughs> 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 uh, I the 60s, okay. Yeah, the 60s. I want to wear the go-go boots and the big eyelashes. Yeah, yeah. And twiggy, and twiggy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, meet all the rock stars. Mm. Notting Hill or was that where they were? I, I thought you were yeah, going to yeah. say Victorian time and I would ask but you. But now you're thrown. <laughs> would, you, would you be a, we wouldn't be a servant. You wouldn't, you would, <laughs> no. you would be the, maybe the. The other. Yeah, I'm not good at housework. <laughs> no, <laughs> banging around in the when you're emptying yeah. the dishwasher. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> do you think? Uh, <laughs> banging around. <laughs> 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 it's not. Yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> wrong English. <laughs> I think uh, was it Harry who <laughs> picked it up? Uh, yes, I, I Marion Keys mm. said. Uh, often said that female writers who write about women mm. and relationships and, and uh, love and family uh, are kind of are just as good writers, of course, mm. as male writers who write well just the same subjects, but mm. are looked upon with different eyes. Mm. Uh, do you feel that too? I think probably most people feel that, most r female writers feel that. It does seem to be, I just read something, I can't even remember what it was in, but just the other day, something about the idea that women writing about women is seen as something for women, whereas men writing about men or women or anything is universal. Mm. And I think that is true. Um, the only thing I would add to that is I'm not sure that I care. <laughs> yeah. I, I, uh, because I know I see, I see on, on Twitter um, a lot of um, authors complaining and saying, you know, why don't men take us seriously? I'm not bothered. Mm. Um, uh, because obviously some do, some individual men do, and that's that's wonderful. Mm. But um, I don't. Yeah, you don't that mind. To you happen. don't mind. No. Um, I think you know. I think I, I said to some people earlier, um, we write what we want to write, and then that finds the readership it's meant to find and yeah. touches 
touches people that it's meant to. Mm. Um, so that's all that really matters to me. You know, I'm, I mean, I'm so lucky compared to the women in Skandal. And, mm. um, I, I can do what I want. I can have a career. I can make my own money. I can make my living out of making up stories. And, um, and then people read them and enjoy them. Mm. And um, so as long as I can do what I want to do, mm. that's fine. I don't care. Mm. No. Good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, <laughs> as you said, you 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 can choose the way you want to. If you want to make this a big thing, or if you just want to yeah. continue doing what you love to do, yeah. and uh, yeah. and luckily for us. Mm -hmm. But it, uh, but of course, it's 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 um, uh, like she said also uh, in this interview uh, that my readers should feel like this is a guilty pleasure to read my books. Uh, yes. Kind of have this feeling, but mm. um, but I thought, okay, so if it's a guilty pleasure, no, it's a pleasure. Mm, it's just a, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But do do you are often invited into you know discussions and things about these things, or is it not so much? Uh, uh, yeah, that comes up as well. Yeah. Um, yes, this idea of a guilty pleasure, or quite often it's um, it's a question. You know, when people do um, quick fire questions, what's your favorite color? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, what are your guilty pleasures? And I don't mm. have any. I just have pleasures, mm. and I, I don't I don't see why there's anything to feel guilty about. I think there's it's a, an idea of, of snobbery. You know, mm, if you yeah. like a particular TV program that you think isn't very mm. impressive or intellectual. But I just think it's really important to, to be happy where we can, because mm. a lot of the time in life, w you know, it's, it's not easy. Mm. Um, so anything that gives us pleasure, great. I mean, as long as it's not hurting anyone, obviously. Mm. Um, yeah, I don't just, know. Uh, do, you, do, you, do you think it's um, uh, to write? You love to write. Some writers love to write and hate these things. Mm. You know, meeting the audience, traveling yeah. around, <laughs> yeah. uh, meeting journalists, etc. Mm. Do you like that as well? It seems yeah. like you like it, but uh, yeah. But uh, how how do you divide it? Do you like um, have some time of the year where you do this, uh, promoting your books, and then you write, or it mix it all time? This kind of thing is usually just um, when a book is published. Mm. And um, for me, that usually lasts about four to six weeks. Mm. So a book comes out, and then I do lots and lots of talking and meeting people. And then I go back to my back box. To bed. And I don't, back I don't see anybody <laughs> for 10 months. <laughs> then you go back to bed and have the tea. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sit there and write. Yeah. Uh, it was very nice meeting you. It was lovely meeting you. And I will meet you again in not. Yeah so long time because <laughs> you are also part of the how do you say that in english now i just mm. i just look at you <laughs> festival uh, uh, the, the, the festival evening festival evening yeah because you're coming there as well yes. that's very good uh so um for so long thank you thank you so much carrie thank, thank you, you. <laughs> um Ja, nu ska jag se si masse viktig information. <laughs> nu måste jag bara huska allt jag fått besked om. Uh, nu är er det paus fram till klockan 5. Då ska du få möta Bonnie Garmer som har skrivit lektioner i god kemi, mm -hmm. som säkert väldigt många har läst och gläder sig till. Och du kan köpa mat och vin här uppe. Du kan gå ned och köpa mat och vin. Och du kan köpa böcker här, inte sant Knut? Ja. ja. Uh, are you signing books now, Tracy? I'm really happy to. If yeah, okay, so yeah. she's signing books. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, nu er det altså pause frem til klokka fem, så bare mingle rundt, ta litt vin, kostra. Uh, som Tracy sier, livet er til for å nytes. Tusen takk for da. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
Kjære alle sammen, hjertelig velkommen igjen til Kappelendams Feel Good Fest. Til dere som er nye, så må jeg bare si at det ble kanskje en litt lang pause nå i sted, men det er fordi at John Boyne og Marion Keys dessverre er blitt syke og ikke kan komme. Men vi har mange andre fantastisk flotte gjester, og det er strålende at så mange tilbringer onsdagskvelden her sammen med oss. Jeg heter fortsatt Kari Vikland. Jeg gleder meg veldig til det vi nå skal gjennom, nemlig kjemitimen. Jeg vet ikke om det er mange flere av meg som ikke var spesielt glad i kjemi på skolen, men etter å ha lest Bonnie Garmes sin debutbok, Leksjoner i god kjemi, så har i hvert fall jeg forandret mening om det. En fantastisk bok som har helt utrolig suksess verden rundt ligger som nummer en i USA, i Tyskland, i flere land, og skal om ganske kort tid bli serie på Apple TV. Så det er helt fantastisk. Igjen en stor applaus. Please welcome Bonnie Garmus. So nice to have you here. Thank you. It's great to be here. And first of all, congratulations with your tremendous success <laughs> worldwide, all over. And uh, yes, it's amazing. Um, so how's life just at the moment? Busy? Yeah. It, it's good. It's yeah. good. Life is good. It's a whole big shock, and it's been a shock for a while now. It's been a shock. Yeah. yeah. Uh, normally, I'm not very interested in people's age. I think age is just a number. I'm 60 years myself, but I have to say uh, that you published this book, your first published book, when you were 65. 64. 64. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I will say, it was like 10 days before my 60th yeah, okay. birthday. Yeah. 64, yeah. yeah. Um, that's rather special, isn't it? Or I think so, but you know, in a way, I didn't realize anyone would care about age because when I read a book I never think how old is the person mm. who wrote this book it never occurred to me so when people said oh my god you published this book when you're in your 60s I thought oh so I wonder what? I've been you know Dickens is like 9,000 years old now I read you know, <laughs> I don't know it just it never occurred to me I, it's been a but surprise it's, it's very inspiring I think for oh, all the people good. who maybe have a book yeah in their head yeah I think it's never too late to to you know it's never too never too late right because um uh, yes, it's just an amazing story, uh, and I said to the audience in Norwegian that you are, the book is number one in many countries, US, where you're from, mm -hmm. even though you live in England and, and uh, in Germany as well. Mm -hmm. um, did you... Uh, did you always know that you wanted to, to write a book? Was that yeah, I mean, I think like Tracy, my childhood dream was to be a writer. Mm. Um, but you know, it is, it is, uh, it can be a, a very iffy career, and if you really need to make a living, mm. it can be very scary. So I think Tracy was really brave, and I was less brave. But I ended up being a copywriter, which is another form of storytelling. Um, much shorter, though. Mm. Much shorter. Much shorter. But you didn't did <coughs> you send in scripts to, to publishing houses and, and got the few shots? Like yeah, no. I wrote another book before Lessons in Chemistry that got 98 rejections. 98. Um, <laughs> that's a kick in the gut. Oh. Um, the, the terrible thing was I wrote a book that was 700 pages long. Mm. Um, and so here's a hot tip if anyone's writing a book. Do not write a 700-page <laughs> book. No one wants to publish that. It turns out there's an economy to publishing that you must be aware of. Books cost a lot. If they're twice the normal size, they cost a lot to the publisher. Mm -hmm. And so they're not so interested. And so the magical the number is? Uh, 350, <laughs> so I went for 400. <laughs> okay, good to know, <coughs> good to know. <laughs> so let's talk about your main character, your heroine, Elizabeth Sott, which who I love. I think everybody who read the book, yeah, everybody <laughs> agree. Um, who is by training a, a research chemist, but being a woman in that particular field in, in the end of the 50s, beginning of the 60s, was very difficult. Yeah. So uh, what does she experience? Well, she experiences a lot of sexism and misogyny. Um, and just a lot of general unfairness, as she puts it. 
Uh, and I think it's, you know, it's because she's living in a society that's governed by myths, just like our society is, mm -hmm. that at that time said women were incapable. They weren't as smart. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting to me is that I set the book in the late 50s and early 60s, but a lot of it is still resonating with women today. And they're like, you know, mm -hmm. I just was in a meeting. Or I get, I get direct messages from women all over the world who say, I'm working in the same lab that Elizabeth Zott works in, mm -hmm. and it's 2023. Ah, so it's still, yeah, and I think everybody, how many have um, had the experience that people taking people, I say people, <laughs> <laughs> maybe I mean men, but maybe <laughs> also women, take credit for your ideas? That's something which, yeah. Yeah. And that happened to you. And you were so angry one day and you s s came home from a meeting and you yeah. just started to write, wasn't that? Yeah, yeah, I call it constructive anger now. Mm -hmm. um, it, yeah, <laughs> I wrote, <laughs> I came out of this meeting and I was, I was really mad because I'd been in a meeting, a technology meeting in the Bay Area. I was the only woman in the room. That's not uncommon in technology. And um, I'd finished presenting all of my ideas and no one said anything. Some of these people I'd worked with for a decade, um, they knew me very well, but no one said anything that day because there was a new vice president in the room. He was a very important person. Mm -hmm. He thought so. And at any rate, he ended up taking credit for all of my ideas. He put his name on this campaign for my ideas. And um, when I left the meeting that day, and no one had stood up for me, when I left the meeting that day, I went back to my desk. And I was supposed to be writing on a deadline for something else. And instead, I wrote the first chapter of Lessons in Chemistry. Wow. <laughs> Revenge. <laughs> Revenge. I, yeah, yeah, either that or it's, it's karma because uh, that vice president is currently unemployed. Oh, love it. Yeah. <laughs> love it. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, so she, uh, Elizabeth, uh, experienced sexual assaults, mm -hmm. uh, people taking credit for her work, stealing her work, yep. and um, uh, female scientists of that time uh, in general, were we used uh, with, skepti with skepticism and uh, suspicion, but Elizabeth is also seen as a threat because of her personality. Mm -hmm. uh, so how would you describe her? Well, I always describe her the same way. She's a rationalist. Mm -hmm. And the reason why she may seem odd is because we all live in such an irrational society. We are used to accepting the myths that our society presents us and tells us we should be a certain way. Women are like this, men are like this. Mm -hmm. And that's not at all true. I was reading about a tribe called the Aka tribe where the men actually lactate and breastfeed. Mm. I mean, the men. the men, because it turns out men can actually do this. Mm -hmm. I had no idea. Um, and <laughs> in, in this, new in this I know, I, I was yeah. like, what hormones do they take? Mm. Um, but no, it's really interesting that, that it just really depends on where you're raised and what sort of ideas are given to you. And mm. in this particular tribe, the men and women um, are very equal in the tribe. Mm. And some days, you know, mostly the women are going off to hunt and the men stay at home and take care of all the children. Mm. And then they switch. Anyway, it's so a fascinating yeah. tribe. But she is, she is not in, in that time where women should be even more than now. Uh, people pleasers, uh, backing up their husbands, uh, don't take too much room, etc. She just do all the opposite things. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's why she's that gets her in some trouble. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Especially in in her working field. But um, I think you said the book is about sexism and and uh, and um, we we're coming back to that. But it's also when I read it, a book about love. Mm -hmm. Many love stories, but the especially the love story between her and this star researcher, Nobel Prize nominated yeah. um, Calvin, mm -hmm. Calvin Evans, who in one way like her, do you think that he also doesn't fit totally? Yeah. But they fit together. Yeah. So it's, uh, but she doesn't want to marry him. Why? Well, because back then, and um, anything that she would have done as a scientist would still be credited to him. Mm. And even if she had not you know, taken his name, she would still be referred to as Elizabeth Evans. Mm. Um, and I did a lot of research. This happened to women all the time. Most women scientists of that era never married and never had children because they knew they couldn't. Mm. Uh, they could not have a career. And the career they had was 
was usually cut short. Rosalind Franklin is a great example of that. Mm. She took a photograph of DNA. She's the original discoverer of DNA, and her, her contribution was buried mm. for years and years. And James Watson and Francis Crick took credit for her work, mm. and that has since been corrected. So she just knew she couldn't marry him because she right. would lose her. But then uh, life happens. Yeah. She finds herself... You must stop me if you think I spoil uh, yeah, much for the people who haven't read it. But she finds herself a widower. Mm. And she loses her job because she's pregnant and unmarried. And uh, kind of depressed, but with a beautiful girl. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly she finds herself as a star of a cooking show, live cooking show yeah. called Separate Six yes. for Women. Yeah. Uh, and how does she use this opportunity and new platform? <laughs> Well, I wanted, when I was writing her, I wanted to give her a pulpit, essentially, to spread her message of chemistry, mm. because our world is actually, of course, run by chemistry. It's mm. not really run by the laws that we enact. Mm. Uh, we're at the, me the, the mercy of science every single day, physics and chemistry, specifically. Mm. And um, I wanted her to go on TV and have no intention of teaching cooking. Mm. but instead to teach women what they were made of, even at a molecular level, mm. to believe in their innate capability. And so she was a real joy to write mm. because, of course, her producers do not want her to do that at all. Mm. And I think, you know, when she starts the show, there are plenty of women who are like, you know, what is she talking about? And then they realize, wait, I am smart. I understand this. Mm. She ends every show with a, a certain thing that she says, children set the table your mother needs a moment to herself. Mm. And I did that because I wanted Elizabeth Zott first to assume that children would be watching the show mm. because she's pretty hard not to watch. Mm. Um, but also because she is instructing the future generation that their mother is someone of worth mm. and they need to respect her. Mm. And she really, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she really uh, empowers her audience, all these women, because she, 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 uh, uh, challenge them to follow the dreams and to see their strength and and it's amazing and it's so funny i worked in television for 18 years and it's so funny to read the way she refused she never smiles a tv in tv uh, on tv and she refused to follow manuscript totally she has to wear dresses but she would like to go with a lab coat and googles yeah. <laughs> and her hair like this with just a <laughs> yeah. pen up uh, in it and uh, for her cooking is serious work mm -hmm. And there's no such thing as just a housewife. Right. So um, cooking for her is a chemistry lesson. Mm -hmm. So it how how can that be? Well, how does she do it? Because cooking actually is chemistry. And if you're a good cook, it turns out you're a very talented chemist. I am not a good cook, and I'm also not a very good chemist. Mm. Um, but it is actually, whenever you um, add heat to anything, you're sparking a new reaction. You're actually breaking bonds and creating new bonds, mm -hmm. and then you put that on a plate and you call it dinner. Mm -hmm. But you've actually, if, you're, if your meal is good, your ex experiment is successful. Your ingredients change every time. You know, no matter what, the eggs that you buy tomorrow are different from the eggs you bought last week. Mm -hmm. Good chefs know how to accommodate these things and change little tiny things to make it work. Mm. So yeah, that's what she's teaching, but really, she's teaching, she's, she's sparking a revolution. Yeah, she's teaching independence. And, but she used words like, uh, w when she presented dishes like uh, sodium chloride and acetic acid? Uh -huh. What is that? Vinegar. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> of course it is. Uh, but did you, I said to the audience when, when I had the small introduction in Norwegian that I was not so very fond of chemistry at school. Mm -hmm. Changed totally now when I read your book. Oh. So I should take it again. Uh, what relationship do you have with chemistry before you? The same as you. I didn't, I didn't excel at chemistry. I took one, you know, I had the required class. Um, it wasn't good. When I decided to make Elizabeth Zott a chemist, I thought, well, how I'll just Google the science. Well, you can't Google old science very well. And so I had to teach myself 50s and 60s chemistry from a textbook. Mm -hmm. And um, 
that was harder than I thought, but I'm used to, as a copywriter, always writing what I don't know. Mm -hmm. So doing the research was fine, but um, I had a couple fires in our flat. <laughs> and because I, did you had to try all these things? I tried. Oh, I tried so many yeah, things. Okay. <laughs> and uh, my husband travels a lot, and I just remember this one time he came back, and the fire department had been there, and um, <laughs> and I didn't say anything. And then he goes, "And what happened here?" And I, the wall was all black, <laughs> and I said, "Oh yeah, I had. Uh, yeah, I was doing this experiment with carbon." And he goes, God, thank God we're renters, right? <laughs> 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 anyway. You didn't burn your hair or your uh, I, 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 yeah, I did. I did burn <laughs> uh, a large portion of hair, but it's cut off now and okay. has regrown. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, she thinks, like you said, that uh, women, if women understands chemistry, they understand how things work in general. Yeah. And you agree about that? because I didn't realize this, because I'm not a scientist, I'm not a chemist, but when I started studying chemistry, it's called the central science for a reason, and that's because it's kind of the one science that rules them all. Now, physicists will tell you that physics is the science uh. that rules them all. Th they kind of live together very well, but you cannot go through a single day without encountering chemistry. You are chemistry. Everything that you touch and see is chemistry. These are all just atoms and molecules, and it is really interesting to sit here and think that we're talking, but really, we're just atoms and molecules, uh. and there are all these chemical changes going on in your body all the time. If you begin to understand that we're all made exactly the same way, we're all actually comprised of the same things, there's a real equality in chemistry. You cannot have an unbalanced chemical equation. It won't work. Mm. And so within the book, there's a theme of balance, both in chemistry Rowing is the sport of balance. Mm. And then in the book, there's a balance of dark and light. The reason why we have climate change problems is chemical, because we have, we have ruined the chemistry of our planet. Mm. And the planet is fighting back. Mm. Do you think girls, young women who read your book will be that you have maybe made a wave of young women more interested in chemistry now than before? I hope so. I've heard from a lot of young women who have said, you know, I'm going to be a chemist or I'm going to be something in the sciences. It's really great to see mm. because, you know, we need all the top brains on everything. Mm. There's no shortage of work. Mm. Still, there is much less women working in these fields. Than that. It's really interesting. Most PhDs now are going to women, mm -hmm. but for some reason, and it has nothing to do with pregnancy, they go into the field and they're not welcome. And so they don't last. They find it to be suffocating because it's very competitive in science, but not in a very positive way. Mm. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I put rowing in the book, because mm. I'm a rower and I didn't have to research it. <laughs> but also because it, it is this sport that requires complete cooperation all the time in order to win. Mm. And that's when people have the same goal. Mm. The corporation. Yeah. I said before that this was is also a beautiful love story between Elizabeth and Calvin, also between Elizabeth and her very special daughter. <laughs> uh, she's also she was reading when she's two. Yeah, and yeah, 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 very. And also between uh, Elizabeth and her daughter Madeline and the family dog. Yeah. Called uh, six thirty. Thirty. Uh, thirty. <laughs> Have to yeah. do with the American. Uh, and the dog is a huge character in your book. Mm -hmm. Uh, why a dog? Because 630 is the one character based on a real thing. Um, we had a dog Friday, and she was super smart. Uh, she, she, we'd gotten her from a shelter, and she'd been extremely badly abused. Someone had burned cigarettes out on her and oh. cut her, and it was she was in terrible shape. And um, we ended up adopting her, and we didn't know it at the time, but we were basically adopting... Gandhi and Einstein, um, <laughs> and she was just super smart, mm. and she wasn't the typical dog where, you know, she'd lay at our feet and just lay there. If we were talking, she'd go like, you're talking, now you're talking, now you're talking. And she mm. got to the point where she recognized a lot of words on her own. We weren't teaching her these words, mm. but we would mention something, and she'd run and get it and show us, like, I know what you're talking about. Mm. <laughs> um, but the biggest example of this was one day I couldn't find my keys. I was on the way to work, and she went to work with me, and I, I said out loud, I can't find my keys. I was just digging everywhere, and she just looked at me like, <laughs> um, She went through my briefcase, 
And then she went through my gym bag. And then she got in the hall closet and she went through every pocket of every jacket. And then she found him and she goes, here. She was throwing oh. on the floor like, can we go? Amazing. Huh? Yeah, she was really something. And then we were transferred abroad to Switzerland and she learned German. I'm not even kidding. <laughs> And 6.30 also knows many, many words. Yes. Yes. And he was really, in the beginning, a uh, dog who was trying to uh, locate bombs. Right. But not so successful. Not good at it. Why? Afraid. Okay. Yeah, oh, fear. Yeah. I think, you know, dogs have an incredible, extraordinary sense of smell. Mm. If any of us could smell what a dog could smell, we would have a superpower and NASA would be studying us. But no, mm. uh, we live with these creatures with extraordinary powers and we just think of them as pets. Mm. And I think that's mm. not a smart thing to do. But 6.30, I wanted a voice from the animal kingdom mm. commenting on all the dumb things we do and say. And I wanted a dog to be confounded by the amount of lies we say, tell each other all the mm, time. Mm. So he was an uh, important He's part. He's really important in the book. Yeah. 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 I think just as important as the human beings. Yeah. 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 Uh, and I love that. Uh, we, you said it before, uh, this is about um, bad treatment of strong women and it's about sexism and you use humor for this, it's it's a, it's a difficult theme. It's it's uh, I mean it's kind of uh, uh, like you said. You 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 we still experience these things. Yeah. But why did you choose to use this form for your subject? I have you no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I no. I just think if you're going to talk about dark things, if you don't add some lightness, mm. it's just too hard. I always think when I'm writing because I've been a copywriter for a long time. Uh, when you're writing something, you're you're trying to tell someone something, and they're not going to listen if it's just down, 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 mm. down. Mm. Um, so it was really important for me to add humor. A because we're pretty laughable species in a lot of ways. We make a lot of stupid errors, mm. uh, and so I wanted to make sure that that was part of it. Mm. And she's really funny. <laughs> well, I would think she's not very funny, but she is just the source of humor because yeah, yeah. she's so intolerable a lot of times. Yeah. Or she just doesn't, you know, she won't conform. Mm. So. How, how do people uh, who read the book react on her? What what do people tell you when they have read it? That they find her like a superhero or that they wanted to be more like her? Or what, what do people say? I think the thing I see quoted most often is, be more zot. Yeah. Um, and that just means, as yeah, a, as a be verb, more zot. Yeah. yeah, stand up for yourself. Don't mm. be afraid to speak up mm. because if you speak up, somebody who was afraid to speak up is suddenly glad that you've spoken up. Mm. And then you start empowering other people. Mm. In the book, Elizabeth Zott is the catalyst who changes every single person she comes in contact with. Mm. Mm. And he's also uh, like this neighbor who helps her and, and how she uh, really empowers her to, to, to make a change in yeah. her life. Um, but you also, um, uh, I've read somewhere that you have said that you wrote this book as, uh, or you, tr you created Elizabeth Sot as an, in honor of your mother. Oh, actually, no. no. I mean, oh, this is terrible. No, I didn't write it for yeah, my mother. Yeah. No, I, I uh, wrote my well, own. Women are from that time? Uh, it was, I needed a role model. Mm. After that meeting that day, I thought, what am I doing wrong? You know, how can I just be sitting here being taken this treatment? And I wrote my role model. That's what I wanted. Yeah, okay. So Elizabeth thought, but no, it is the books in honor of my mother, mm. who was one of those women of that generation mm. and whose struggle I had never fully appreciated. Mm. Yeah, I, I, when I was reading it, I was also uh, thinking about my own mother because she's, uh, she was, um, yeah, like you said, with four kids, uh, backing up my father's career m and making her own uh, way in life in middle age, which yeah. I think maybe was common for maybe our mother yeah. generation. Yeah. But do people say that to you, that they feel that maybe they see their own mothers or people from that time in a different way? Yeah, reading? I've heard from a lot of people saying my grandmother, my mother, oh my God, you know, I mm. never thought about, and I have to say, I never thought about mm. my own mom and what she'd given up. Mm. And I never thought about all those other women in the neighborhood and what they'd given up. Mm. And there were some really smart 
women who weren't allowed to do anything. All they did was laundry. Mm. The worst part for me, when I think back, is that they were always called average. Mm. Can you imagine? Or just your a entire, housewife. Yeah, yeah mm. your entire life, you're just called an average person. Mm. Mm. What a message to mm. send. It's awful. Yeah, it's horrible. But uh, but uh, like you said, it's, 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 it's kind of scary also that, like you said, that these we, we like to think, I think, that these things were before, like in the 50s, right. 60s, but like you said, that we all can resonate to, towards these things. Yeah. Do you think it's still a problem that women are not seen? Uh, it's a enough? huge problem mm. because we have really huge problems to solve. Mm. And the fact that women are still experiencing this at work, I mean, in the book, there are some bad men, but there are also some male allies in that book mm. who very strongly support these women. Calvin Evans is mm. one of them. Mm. You know, he falls in love with Elizabeth Zott because she's smart. He's not intimidated by her. Mm. He loves that part of her. Mm. He celebrates that part of her. Mm. And so that's why they work so well, because he admires her. Mm. And so I think that it's a really interesting idea, you know, when women go into the workplace and they find it to be unwelcoming. What is it about that environment? Why is there so much competition between the sexes when in other parts of the world that's not true? Mm. It's just our society. Mm. It's very strange. Yeah. But now um, you could leave that workplace and all these people in that meeting and yeah. say goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> Good riddance. <laughs> And now uh, the book is going to be a series on Apple TV yes. with the Oscar winner uh, Brian Larson mm -hmm. as Elizabeth. How involved are you in these things? I really wanted to write it. And uh, when, when Hollywood approached me, um, uh, I said that. And my agents and editors were like going like this. And, okay. and I didn't know why. <laughs> and they said, You'll be really busy. And I said, doing what? About doing this you know you travel a lot and you give a lot of talks and things but um, there's just a whole lot to the promotion it's more than a full-time job so I was so naive I just they there's they still love to kid mm. me about that but I think um, yeah so Apple TV did it it's all filmed okay um, it's all filmed already it's yeah it's yeah the trailer is out it's on yeah. YouTube yeah we've seen that yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yeah. Yep. so yeah. yeah so they're ready to go but how how is that how was, was this I mean uh, like you said you 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 wrote the book 28 times before yeah and suddenly uh, the book is a huge success it's going to be a, um, a series on TV yeah did you had any feeling when you wrote it that this was maybe going to be it for no you? <laughs> no, 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 never. And I told one friend that I was writing this book and I said what it was about and she just looked at me like, <laughs> oh, okay, so it's a chemist who has a TV show. This sounds awful. And oh. I, th you know, <laughs> I, I have to admit the way I would pitch it sounded, even when I pitched it to my agent, it sounded bad. And, you know, I just think it's, um, it's hard to explain what it actually is, mm. so I just... So you didn't have this inner feeling that this was going to be a success? No, no, I had... I was certain that it would never get published. I was certain I wouldn't... You know, after you get rejected 98 times, you just <laughs> brace yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but no, I, you know, I got an agent. She's really wonderful, and, um, and she saw what I saw, and so that was really so good. So is it like... A snowball rolling because, or how how does it happen? Do, do they call you and say that we have fifty bidders for your book, or how did it happen? That just like that, she okay. took the book to Frankfurt Book Fair, and the night before, she she called me on the phone. She goes, "Okay, look, your book's kind of quirky. Yeah. Uh, we like it, but sometimes we take a book to Frankfurt. There are no offers. You know, it's just crickets. You won't hear anything. Um, don't." So let's just keep our expectations really low mm. um, because let's face it, it's a really odd mm. story. Mm. And so I said, okay, great. Uh, and then she called me uh, about 12 hours later and she said, just cancel everything I <gasps> said. Okay. Uh, and um, yeah, so we got 16 offers right away. I mean, just 16. Just, just like boom. Mm. It was like wildfire. Mm. And then we went to auction in the United States, huge auction. And in the middle of that auction, Suddenly, we had 38 Hollywood places calling. Mm. You know, I just thought, how is this happening? My whole family is like, really? <laughs> 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 so 
because you believe it now. Everybody believes it now. Yeah. Yeah. But um, uh, I know writers doesn't want to talk about new projects because they think it can. What are you saying? Jinx. Jinx. Yeah. Jinx yeah. It. So uh, I will not ask you what you're writing, but are you writing? Yeah. Yeah. Is that difficult? Is it easier now that you know you have, uh, you know what to do, or is it uh, more difficult because you? People have so high expectations. There are some high expectations, but you know, once I'm in that other story, I like being in that world. And I, you know, I think the main key, something that Tracy said earlier today, she said about writing with confidence, mm. and that's what you have to do. You have to just trust your voice and write with confidence, and is, and then hope to God somebody else thinks you're writing with confidence, and uh, <laughs> and then and then go from there. But that's only if I can't surprise myself, if I can't entertain myself, I'm not going to be able to mm. give it to other people either. Mm. But did you have, uh, uh, when you write a person like Elizabeth, w who is so, uh, how do I say it, special, did you uh, had a picture of her in your head in a way? Did you look, knew what she looked like? Well, you know what? I. So in the book, I didn't describe anyone. No, yeah, that's why. But do I you have a picture in your head? Yeah, no, I had a picture of her in my head. Actually, my editors made me put in, a, 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 like, just at least mm. say something about her. Um, uh, I purposely didn't want to identify anyone mm. um, by race or hair color or anything. Mm. Um, but anyway, they made me put in a few things, and that was fine. But I know I had a very clear picture of what she looked like. And when I saw the trailer, yeah, that was what I read. when Brie Larson, s she tur she's sticking a pencil in her hair and she turns and she faces the camera, I went, there she is. Mm. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Yeah. And when can we see this? October. October. Oh, everybody is looking forward to that. Uh, it was such a, we should have had the book here. Where is it? It's not here. Yeah. You, um, you will sign books, yeah, yeah, and you will be there. It's a book, yeah. Maybe we can. No, we no, we can so. Yeah, so it's um, I just love the book. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's the I same know. in English, isn't it? Yeah, it's, this mm, is the same. British yeah. uh, version, and then there are all sorts of covers. The United States has the worst cover. Yay! <laughs> the worst, um, the worst. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They have to change it for the paperback. But the, um, but yeah, this is a great cover. Mm -hmm. And uh, <coughs> Germany has a completely different. Actually, there, there are forty nations, and I think there are like, I mean, it's just bizarre. Mm. Estonia. If you ever go to my website, look for Estonia's cover. <laughs> it's wild. <laughs> yeah. Estonia. It's like uh, the Eurovision Song Contest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <pretty laughs> yeah. So this it was. This is just an amazing book, and also the success story. You called yourself the Queen of Refusals, so or, or something, or since you had ninety-eight. Well, it's so <laughs> funny because I read that. I never said that. The <laughs> writer put that yeah, in, yeah, but and yeah. yeah, and I said. You, you put in what you you called me the yeah. queen of rejection. She goes, I know, and then I just made you say it. And I went, <laughs> I didn't say that, <laughs> but I guess it fits. Yeah, anyway. but not anymore. Not yeah, anymore. Well, yeah, not finally. Anymore. So it's um, an amazing story, the thank book you. and your story. So thank you, thank you, thank you for thank you. Uh, being here. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Nå får jeg beskjed om å si at dere kan naturligvis kjøpe bøker, og uh, Bonnie vil signere bak her. Og så er det en liten pause nå, uh, ti minutter, før uh, Sara og Natasha skal uh, fortsette programmet. Da skal det handle om uh, romantikk og julestemning og julebøker. Så bare bli her utover, og så er det festkveld i kveld klokka sju. Det foregår nede, men nå kan dere mingle, drikke litt vin og snakke litt med Bonnie i disse ti minuttene. Tusen takk for at dere kom.
19.00, så er det Feel Good Fest der nede. Og da er det sånn at de av dere som har billett, dere får et sånn bånd på armen. Og de av dere som ikke har billett, må gå ut i køen. Altså regner vi med at det blir plass, men dere må uansett gå den veien etterpå. Ok, men nå skal jeg ønske velkommen til førhjulstreff. For her i Kaplendam så begynner vi til og med tidligere enn de som pynte Karl Johan. Og det er godt gjort i seg selv. Jeg vet ikke hvordan det er med dere, men jeg har alltid hatt det sånn i mange år at jeg må se visse filmer eller høre spesielle låter som en slags oppladning til jul. Men de siste årene så har det heldigvis også gjeldt bøker. Og nå skal dere få møte to forfattere som de siste årene har startet juletida ekstra tidlig for at vi skal ha gode juleromaner å kose oss med. Så ta godt imot Siri Østli og Kjersti Herland Jonsen. Hei, velkommen. Tusen takk. Jeg kan jo fortelle dere at jeg allerede her nede før vi gikk opp har fått klage fordi jeg ikke har med julegaver til disse to. Vi får se om jeg kan få løpt ut og kjøpt noe etterpå. Hei, Siri og Kjersti. Hei. Denne tradisjonen med juleromaner kom til Norge fra England for noen år tilbake. Hva er det som fascinerer oss så med juleroman? Jeg tror... Den passer jo inn i julen da. Vi har julefilmer, vi har en slags julebobble, kanskje, som vi liker å være i. Og en juleroman passer jo inn der også. Alt som handler om jul er jo helt supert i julen. Jeg tenkte det at når jeg først begynte å tenke på om det burde finnes flere norske juleromaner, tenkte jeg det er egentlig en selvfølge, fordi nordmenn leser veldig mye, og i Norden er vi også veldig opptatt av julefering. Så den kombinasjonen er jo egentlig helt perfekt. Og dere har da tatt tak i dette og gjort noe med det, og jeg sa i sted at det er litt tidlig kanskje å snakke om jul, men Siri, det var vel omtrent på den tida her du begynte å skrive på adventskalenderen? Ja. Og for deg så passer det egentlig helt perfekt. For meg så er det helt supert at det skjer noe. Ja, det var... Jeg hadde jo ikke tenkt, det var ikke så veldig mange juleromaner da jeg begynte å skrive den, ikke norske i alle fall. Så det var Ida Kleve, redaktøren min, hun er nede, som sa at kan ikke du skrive en juleroman? Og det var helt perfekt, for det var i påsken, og det var under pandemien. Jeg tenker alle husker hvordan pandemien var. Det var fryktelig sørgelig. Jeg hadde en bitt liten kohort, og det var liksom bare to personer som kunne sette seg om gangen omtrent. Og da å skrive en juleroman, det var forferdelig koselig. Det var så hyggelig å sitte der og liksom skrive om jul og om julekaker, og selv om det er en litt dramatisk roman, så var det veldig, veldig koselig. Ja, og vi skal snakke litt om dramatikken i boka din snart. Men Kjersti, hvorfor ville du skrive juleroman? Nei, det var det jeg tenkte at det var en veldig god setting for en god fortelling. Altså, det er mye stemning. I en god underholdningsroman skal du også ha mye god stemning og potensial for katastrofe. Og i julen har du egentlig begge deler, så du har så utrolig mye du kan øse av det. Og du har en forventning som også gjør at du har mange muligheter for drama, når du skal se om disse forventningene kan innfris. Og drama er det jo her i begge bøkene. Vi kan begynne med adventskalenderen, Siri. Altså, Fie er nyskilt og får en utfordring og et spark i reva, hvis vi skal være helt ærlige, av søsteren sin med det vakre navnet Sara. Fortell litt om hva adventskalenderen handler om. Fie er, altså jeg ville ha en en hovedperson som var litt eldre, som var sånn 45-50, et eller annet sånt middelalderende. Og hun skulle... Hva sa du nå? Nei... Stå på deg litt. Ikke helt ung. Jo, veldig ung. Ja. Takk. Fie er da veldig ungdommelig, og 45-50. Og hun... For en... Jeg ville at hun skulle miste det meste. At hun skulle virkelig havne litt på bånd. Og det er ikke så lett å få til med en kvinne i denne alderen der, som vi gjerne har en del, så derfor er Fie tannlegeassistent for sin mann tannlegen. Og når han da finner en annen en, som han foretrekker, som faktisk er tannlege og ikke bare tannlegeassistent, 
så tar da, så setter han jo fil på døren, så å si, finner en ganske elendig leilighet til henne, og sender henne avgårde dit. Og da er jo fie helt der nede, hun har mistet status, jobb, mann, familie, alt som er egentlig. Og så er det hennes vei oppover der, der vi hjelper av sin søster, Sara. Ja, for å si litt om den utfordringen hun får av søsteren sin. Sara, siden fie da har virkelig hamnet på bånd ved hjelp av valium og jeg vet ikke hva, så sier Sara at du skal få en utfordring hver dag. Det er adventskalenderen. Vi skal ha en utfordring hver dag som du skal gjøre. Og det kan jo være en veldig enkel utfordring. Du må bake kaker til å begynne med det. Og så kan det være litt sånn hyggelig. Du må få et kjæredyr. Det gjør Fie med glans. Hun får et ganske stort kjæredyr. Og så kan det være litt verre å gå på date eller finne en jobb eller alt det der. Alle disse tingene. Og det gjør da Fie så godt hun kan. Det er ikke alt hun får det til, men så godt hun kan. Til da og det er jo så hyggelig med jul, for da kan du ha med julekvelden som en sånn slutt der. Og da, hvis man røper for mye, så blir det jo julekveld på fire år da. Og så nevnte du Valium. Men det må vi faktisk snakke litt om, fordi det er jo en tematikk her også som du tar litt tak i, hvor det er viktig, ikke sant? Fordi hun tar jo tabletter og prøver på en måte å komme litt opp på den måten, og det er jo noe sønnen hennes reagerer veldig på. Ja, for Fie tar jo, hun tar ganske mange tabletter, og er da, sønnen observerer henne da, fordi når hun ikke er helt, helt på topp, og sønnen synes ikke noe om dette, sønnen er kanskje litt snobbet av seg, eller det er vel egentlig ingen sønner som liker, han er voksen altså, 20 pluss et eller annet som liker å se moren sin gå rundt og være noe på shoppen på gata, kan jeg tenke meg. Men det gjør han, og da vil han ikke egentlig ha noe mer med fie å gjøre i den. Så hun må også ta, det er også en del av arbeidskalenderen at hun skal prøve å ta tak i det forholdet til sønnen og komme dit igjen. Kjersti, jul på Himmelfjell Hotel. Ingrid, er egentlig, ja det er lov. Når du smyker deg så elegant opp, så er det greit. Bra. Ingrid er egentlig fjellklatrer og ekspedisjonsleder, men vender hjem for å drive hotell. Ja, altså hun kommer fra en familie som har drevet et høyfjellshotell oppe i fjellheimen helt siden turismen begynte. Så det har de gjort i flere generasjoner, men hun har også nå... Fram til boka begynner, så er det Ingrid sin bestemor som har vært direktør og som har drevet dette høyfjellshotellet. Ingrid har hatt en veldig vellykket karriere som fjellklatrer og ekspedisjonsleder. Hun er liksom sånn toppklasseklatrer, så hun har jo vært med på sånne store kjente ekspedisjoner og vært litt sånn kjendes egentlig innen sin kategori. Men så har det før vår historie begynner, så har vi vært i en alvorlig ulykke i et skred som gjorde at hun mistet veldig mye og har lagt opp den karrieren. Og så har det egentlig blitt også det som har gjort at hun gjør det som nok har, hun har visst hele veien at hun på et eller annet tidspunkt skal gjøre. Hun skal vende tilbake og så begynne å drive dette familiehotellet. Men så kommer vi jo hjem der, og da er det jo ikke sånn... Hun har liksom tenkt at det går greit, og bestemor ordner dette, og familien har alltid gjort det. Men når hun kommer hjem, så er det jo selvfølgelig en masse praktiske utfordringer. Og det første jul, hvor hun skal være direktør, og ja, det hender både det ene og det andre, da, på dette hotellet. Og så er det jo et eller annet med et høyfjellshotell som kan gi oss litt sånn der vibber på og sånn mystikk og mysterie og sånn. Og det har du jammen plass til i julromanen også, du. Ja, den er liksom... Når jeg begynte å skrive, altså selv om det ikke er en krim, så var jeg litt inspirert av den litt sånn Agatha Christie-aktige settingen. Dette med at du er et sted, et hotell, sant? Det kan... Ting kan skje. Du kan jo snø inne. Det kan komme veldig mye rare gjester som du ikke vet helt hvorfor de er der, og det gir liksom en åpning for både overraskelser og uhygge eller mysterier da. Jeg snakket i stedet om at jeg i mange år har hatt 
tradition med någon ting jag på något sätt jag må ha för att det är er jul. Uh, og så i tillegg til disse bøkene, hva må dere ha? Hva må du ha, Siri, for at det skal være jul for dig? Hva må du se, eller høre, eller bake? Det, jeg gjør jo veldig mye til jul, da. Egentlig. Du er en sånn en, ja. Jeg, jeg er en sånn en. Ja, jeg har lagt det, altså. <laughs> jeg planlegger veldig mye som jeg ikke får gjort også, så jeg er en sånn en også, altså. Bra, det var ja. godt å høre. <laughs> Men uh, det, det er jo mye man gjør, sant? Julekake, de må være sånn, de må pepperkake, tokenkringelig, og så videre. Hvor mange slag er vi på? Nu har jeg døtre, så jeg slipper å gjøre det selv. Smart. Ja. <laughs> så jeg bakker ikke svelme selv, jeg bakker to, altså. så bakker jeg plumpudding, og det, det er ikke noe. Ja. Den er ikke så god, men den må være med. Ja, men det er ikke godt med plumpudding, altså. <laughs> men vi må tenne på den til jul. Det må vi hver jul tenne på den. For det er en sånn tradition jeg har med fra det jeg var liten. Og så, men det er ingen som orker å spise den. Så... så Og så er det tante Pose, ser jeg, selvfølgelig, til jul. Fanny Alexander. Det, det er ganske mye sånn, egentlig. Så man, må, man må jo ikke ha det, men det er jo det som skaper julestemning. Bøker som man skal lese, selvfølgelig. Det er Dickens, synes jeg, må lese. Jule, hva er det neste nå? Jule... Julefortelling. Er det julefortelling? Det er hjertespesielt, ja. Den, og Karl Bert. Dels, uh, jo, den er veldig fin å lese til jul. Ja, det, er, det er ganske mye som man bør, bør lese. Og merker dere nå, hvordan, bare fordi Siri snakker mm. om det, så kommer julestemningen liksom <laughs> krypende. Glemmer litt når vi er på året akkurat nå, det er deilig. Mm, det er det. Kjersti, hva, hva må du ha for at det skal være jul? Jeg sitter og noterer sånn tips i bakhodet. Jeg er sånn, ok, får barna til å bake julekaka? Ja. Ja, det var løs. Det er <laughs> jeg er ikke noe sånn stor baker, men, men det er jo noen sånne ting som pepperkaker, og som da yngste barna har begynt å bake selv, og det er veldig, veldig koselig. Um, og så er det jo, vil jeg jo gjerne spise tinnekjøtt. Uh, det er liksom vår julemat. Uh, men jeg er egentlig en ganske sånn pragmatisk julefeier, og selv om jeg liker veldig godt traditionene da, liker at adventstiden har sin musik, liker um, en del av den klassiske musikken, juleoratorie, den type ting. Man pleier å gå i kirken på julaften. Um, men jeg har, samtidig så er det sånn at hvis jeg fe- får en annen mat, Hvis vi feirer jul i utlandet, så tar ikke jeg med meg pinnekjøtt, liksom. <laughs> da da ta, gjør vi det sånn som de har det der, sant? Sånn at, uh, men ja, Love Actually, jeg har jo blitt en sånn, en, uh, ju, nesten som en sånn juleevang, ekstra juleevangelium. <laughs> um, så det er noen sånne ting, og så er det liksom den helt tra- tradisjonelle julaften, uh, egentlig å være sammen med familien, og det å ha liksom, måltider sammen, og julegavene og juletre, og den, uh, den, den ju- julaften som man skal være der. Mm. Mm. Og så hører man jo at når man er forfatter, uh, så må man egentlig skrive hver dag. Finnes ikke ferie? Mm-hmm. Skriver du på julaften, Siri? Selvfølgelig gjør jeg det. Nei, det er <laughs> Jeg gjør ikke det. Nei. Ikke en gang juleroman? Ikke en gang juleroman. Nei. Nei, jeg skriver ikke på julaften. Gjør du det? Er det noen som skriver? Uh, nei, hvis jeg fikk en... Jeg tenker jeg ville skrive den her. Hvis jeg, fikk, hvis jeg våkner med en god idé, ah, ja. så ville jeg notert den. Men jeg ville nok ikke satt av en arbeidsøkt, nei. <laughs> ikke akkurat den dagen. Det er godt å høre. Uh, vi skal snakke litt mer om bøkene, selvfølgelig. Uh, og Kjersti, uh, vi snakket om Ingrid, som uh, er tidligere fjellklatrer. Uh, og det er jo, det snakket vi om uh, litt uh, bak her i sted, det er jo uh, en del fjellklatring. Uh, og det er s- beskrevet sånn og skrevet om på den måten at både Siri og jeg tenker at Kjersti har drevet mye med fjellklatring. <laughs> jeg er veldig fornøyd med det da, for det er flere som har trodd at det hun er jo klatrer, og det er jeg ikke. Men da tenker jeg at da har jo fiksjonen fungert. Uh, heldigvis er det jo ikke sånn at hvis du skriver krim, så må du jo ikke være morder heller da, heller. Så det. <laughs> så, så, men, nei, men jeg har gjort en del research, og redaktøren min har jo vært opptatt av dette med klatringen, så jeg har tilbrakt mine timer med YouTube og Everest-ekspedisjoner for å få til dette. Men det jeg gjør selv er jo at jeg liker å gå i fjellet. Så at jeg har et, uh, sånn, og det tenker jeg en kanskje merker også i boka, at uh, 
Jag har også et nært forhold til åvær på fjellet og liksom forskjellige typer natur. Men de har liksom de der heftige veggene der de overlatt deg til Ingrid, hovedpersonen. Mm. Og sånn apropos research, eh, hvordan har du gjort det til denne romanserien? Fordi et eksempel for mig er at eh, det er et, altså et fiksjonsunivers, altså det er ikke noe ja. spesifikt sted, men Nei. for mig så får litt sånn der rør og svibber, og du får litt sånn, men, men du bor jo på frongener. Ja. Ja. Så hvordan har du liksom kreert dette stedet som er noe helt annet enn, enn frongener? De fleste tror det er på sagene. Er det sant? Ja. Oh ja jeg Alle ville flytte meg lenger du er på ut av ja. byen. Ja, 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 det kan godt hende. Jeg, jeg, skri, jeg skriver ofte om de der områdene der. Jeg vet ikke helt hvorfor, jeg kjenner dem jo ikke sånn kjempegodt. Så det, er, det blir et slags fantasiunivers, tror jeg. Men det er lettere å putte folk inn i en, en, et egentlig et sted hvor jeg har bodd. Jeg tror ikke jeg kunne skrevet en roman om Frogner eller, eller Gjøvik, hvor jeg kommer fra og alt det der. Så, det er jo ikke egentlig research, men samtidig så har jeg jo døtre som bor rundt omkring i byen. Det er, liksom, det er, det er disse et døtrene hus, igjen, ja. ja, 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 ja. <laughs> så det er et hus der og et hus der, og så setter jeg det sammen litt, og så blir det sånn, tror jeg. Men jeg er ikke veldig god på research. Jeg er god på å google, det er jeg. Men ikke, ikke sånn å gå rundt og liksom. Nei. Det er på. Men når du lager deg et mm. fiktivt sted, mm. er det sånn da at du setter deg ned og skriver, altså lager du dette stedet, eller bare skriver du deg inn og finner ut deg, ja, nå gikk vi til høyre der også, eller <laughs> vet du hvordan stedet ser ut? Nej, jo, kanskje av og til, men, men det er sånn jeg, må, jeg skriver det, og så går jeg over etterpå, og så kan redaktøren også gå over og si at du, du, du har to hus, og det huset der hadde tre etasjer der, og nå er det to. Så det, det er litt sånn, liksom. Så der er jeg heldig som er en god redaktør, redaktør på det. Og fordelen med å finne på et sted er jo at ingen kan ingen ta deg på noe. Ingen kan ta, og det er veldig viktig, altså. Folk tar en på ting hvis man liksom er veldig for presis. Har du opplevd det? Ja, ja, og ja. Jeg opplevde det. Ja, opplevde det på kakeoppskrifter og blomster og folk, ja. Og, det, og jeg er jo litt sånn unøyaktig av meg, så det... Jeg fikk også et spørsmål fra oversetteren til dansk, om det var, virkelig skulle være natron og ikke bakepulver i, ja, den, i de pepperplakene. Ja. Så det, dette, mm. det er jo kvalitetstenn, det. Nå tar en på ja. høyeste alvor ja. det som står der. Ja. Hva, ja. Hvordan tenker du, Kjersti, i forhold til steder og plassering og ting? Nei, altså jeg skriver jo fra et fiktivt sted, men som jeg ser veldig tydelig for meg, og jeg ser det for meg som et relativt konkret, eller kanskje sammensatt av noen konkrete steder mm. hvor jeg har vært. Men det er jo også nettopp det at hvis du skriver at dette er akkurat der, så får du mail fra noen som sier at ja, men hvis du kjører fra Lillehammer da, så tar det jo to og en halv time og ikke, mm. eh, ikke en og en halv time, sånn som du skriver. Mm. Så du må liksom ha litt slingringsmål. Men jeg vet både hvordan hotellet ser ut, hvordan fjellet ser ut, hvordan personene ser ut. Jeg har til og med sånn dokument med bilde av personene, sånn som de ser ut i mm. mitt hode, som jeg har funnet på nett. Så har jeg sånne... Du ikke ekte bilder? Ja, altså ekte fotografier av ekte folk som ser ut sånn som jeg tenker at hovedpersonene mine ser ut. Altså noen av de som sitter her nå kan risikere å være hjemme. <laughs> ja, ja, ja. <laughs> Men det er veldig gøy. Det har jeg ja. ikke hørt om før, at du rett og slett går inn og finner bilder på nett, for liksom, det er denne det, det, jeg karakteren. Jeg lærte i en sånn, uh, jeg leser av og til bøker om kreativitet eller skrivetips og sånn, og en av de var veldig sånn konkret, og der lærte jeg det tipset, at du finner et bilde av sånn som den personen ser ut, fordi da husker du når du skriver om henne, at du forteller om det. Lange, de, de lange gule krøllene, eller uh, den artige fasongen på ørene, eller, altså du har så kanskje noen sånne kjennetegn da. Det var veldig lurt. Ja, ja, ja men det er det. <laughs> ja, for hva, hva gjør du med, med personen da? For eksempel Fie, er du, har du henne tydelig for deg? Har du bestemt deg i forveien akkurat hvordan uh, Fie ser ut? Nei, ikke, nei, ikke i forveien. Uh, sånn underveis. Men, men så forsvinner hun nok ut igjen. Det gjør hun også når jeg er ferdig med å skrive om henne. Så nå husker jeg, jeg er ikke helt sikker på hvordan hun ser ut nå lenger. Men da hadde jeg et klart bilde av Fie. Så sånn og sånn ut. Ja, men, og det, det du sier der kan vi også snakke litt om, mm -hmm. hvis det er greit for deg. Ja, ja, det er helt greit. Fordi at da vi snakket om at vi skulle snakke om boka, mm -hmm. så sa du, ja, hvis jeg husker den da. Ja. Uh, <laughs> 
för det du måste förklara lite vad som sker med dig när du är er färdig med ett uh, skrivprojekt. Altså, du lever ju i dem, men de är er ju bara i huvudet mitt, sant? Och de försvinner ju ut när boken kommer ut. Och då huskar jag dem inte. Jag huskar inte vad de heter. Jag huskar Jeg husker ikke hva de gjorde. Jeg husker egentlig veldig, veldig litt... Nei, det er ikke så veldig morsomt, altså, fordi folk kommer, og så sier de, husker det, den personen jo var veldig viktig for mig eller de ringer og sier, å, det var så sørgelig med det der hun som døde, og jeg er litt sånn, hvem var det som døde? <laughs> og det er jo... Det, ja, man fremstår ikke så veldig intelligent, da, det må jeg si. <laughs> Vi snakker ger mye om jul som en någon god och positiv och när tid men uh, det är er ju också en, en tid och en höjtid som är er vanskelig och sår för många mm. uh, som också på ett vis berörs lite i bägge romanerna uh, mm. ja för fie tänker ju hela tiden att du ska fira jul alene och det är er ju så det är er ju för i alla fall för norrmän tror jag och inte andra så är er det ju nog det värste att vara alene på julekvällen det är er en sån ting. Och folk är er ju ensamma i julen det är er inte ja det är er trist och så är er det också mycket tror jag lite komplicerat med julen för folk som också har folk att fira samman med sant det är er folk som för det drejer som traditioner det er som folk man har fött med för det er som förväntningar det är er ganska mycket som ska stappas in i den där julekvällen som kan bli lite vanskelig for mange, tror jeg nok. Jeg tenker at, um, at det er, jul blir litt sånn forstørrelsesglass mm. på livet, da, for det, det, liksom, de gledene du har, eller de problemene du har, det blir litt forstørre akkurat da. Mm. Hvis du er ensom, så er du litt ekstra ensom mm. hvis du er på julaften. Og hvis du er lykkelig forelsket og har det fantastisk, så har du det kanskje sikkert ekstra fantastisk på julaften. Uh, og, uh, men nettopp det at du har uh, disse vanskene er jo det som også gjør det til en interessant tid. Altså, bøkene ville jo bli utrolig kjedelige også da, hvis det bare var sånn, ja, så var det veldig koselig, da, og så bakte de kaker og så sånn. Altså, du må jo ha ting som kan gå galt, og, og kanskje sånn at hvis det går bra på slutten, uh, uh, som det jo bør gjøre uh, i en juleroman, så må det kanskje gjøre det på en litt annen måte enn det som hovedpersonen hadde sett for sig som den ideelle jul. Da. Sånn at den viser, at den kanskje kan vise litt forskjellige måter og hvor raushet eller forskjellige sammentreff gjør at folk uh, får det bra selv om utgangspunktet var um, ikke så lett. Da. Og nå synes jeg også du er inne på, på noe interessant, uh, Kjersti, og nå skal ikke vi røpe noen bransjehemmeligheter her, kanskje noen, men, men er det, du sier at det bør jo ende godt og sånn, er det, finnes det en slags, ikke oppskrift, for det gjør du jo virkelig ikke innen kunsten og litteraturen, men, men er det på en måte en formel, så det, en feel-good roman, og kanskje spesielt en julroman, da må vi ha med dette, at det må nærme seg jul, den, det er... Opplagt. Men utover det, er det noen, noen spesielle ting? Jeg tror... Hvis det skal være feel good, så må det jo ha en form for lykkelig slutt. Altså, det må ikke nødvendigvis være den lykkelige slutten som du, du tror du skal ha når du skal begynne å lese boken. Men det skal jo gi en form for uh, håp eller forløsning. Mm. Jeg tenker at feel good, man er også et Det skal jo være et sted og man liker å være i, man liker å lese. Altså, feel good er jo at du skal få det til å føle at du kan du ha lyst til å være der, eller at du liker universet, liker det som er. Om det, det, bør, det er veldig ofte så er det jo god slutt, selvfølgelig. Mm. Det, er jo det var en, en smart dame som snakket med mig om, om feel good, og hun sa at det er jo... Det kan jo også være som en form for selvhjelpsbok i romanform. Og det tenkte jeg på når jeg leste din bok mm. også, det, den var kanskje et veldig godt eksempel mm. på det. At det, altså det, er, det han er jo kanskje folk som av en eller annen grunn har havnet i en vanskelig situation, Og så blir det jo da på en kanskje litt humoristisk eller eh, liksom lett måte, men at en nettopp tar fatt i det, hvordan, hva kan en gjøre for å gjøre sitt eget liv bedre? Så det, det synes jeg var en ganske god eh, definition egentlig av feel good. Mm. 
Og fordi av dere som fortsatt ikke har lest adventskalenderen eller jul på Himmelfjell Hotel, så skal vi jo selvfølgelig ikke røpe noe. Men jeg kan si at alle ingredienser det har vært snakket om her oppe i dag, finnes i disse to bøkene. Tenker dere at en juleroman må man lese i desember? Nei, det tror jeg ikke. Men man kan lese den i alle fall. Kanskje ikke midt på sommeren, eller man kan selvfølgelig det også naturlig. Jeg skriver det jo midt på sommeren, så hvorfor gjør det? Ja, det er sånn. Du startet å skrive i påsken. I påsken, ja, ja. Det spørs jo hvor glad en er i jul, og hvis en er sånn skikkelig juleperson, så kan vi jo ha sånn jul hele året, liksom. Vi kan supplere julestemning. Jeg leser jo faktisk juleromaner andre ganger enn. Ja, for det gjør jeg jo nemlig. Ja. Jeg tenker at det må være helt greit. Det er en god roman, men uansett når vi lever. Forhåpentligvis kan jo folk ha glede av den uansett. Men så kan en jo også lese den som en nesten sånn julekalender, som jeg vet noen gjør da, med de som er inndelt med sånn et kapittel per dag. Og da kan det jo være en sånn at det passer å begynne 1. desember og jobbe seg ut. Da kan jeg bare skyte inn at da har man et problem med disse to bøkene, som jeg jo da kan snikskryte litt av. Fordi at hvis man har som ambisjon med disse to bøkene å lese det som en slags julekalender og begynner 1. desember, da har du trøbbel tredje. For da er du ferdig. Du har ikke klart å vente med å lese det. Du kan ikke legge fra deg disse til rett kapittel og vente et døgn. Det går ikke. Det er jo kompliment. Det er et kompliment. Jeg er nysgjerrig på hva som kommer nå. Hva, Siri, skriver du på noe nytt? Jeg skriver på noe nytt, ja. Men, men... Men du husker ikke hva? Jo, jo. Jeg gjør det. Jeg husker hva. Men jeg er sånn som ikke snakker om det før jeg har levert et praktisk talt ferdig manus. Og så, da redigeres det jo selvfølgelig, og ting skjer og alt det der. Men før det så gjør jeg det ikke. Det ødelegger på en måte. Eller greia. Først leser mannen min det, og så leser redaktøren det, og så... Da kan jeg begynne å fikse på det. Så der får ikke døtrene være med? Nei, nei, nei. Nei, du bruker ikke det. Nei, 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 nei. Men kan du røpe om det er en juleroman? Jeg tror kanskje det blir noe jul oppi der. Men jeg har ikke kommet helt... Jeg kan hende jeg plukker julen vekk og helt kommer ustent med henne. Men du er i gang. Jeg er i gang. Spennende. Vi gleder oss. Kjersti? Ja, nå blir det sånn med far for å jinkse det da. Ja, vi kan banke, jeg kan banke jeg også. Nei, jeg har begynt på det som jeg håper skal bli en oppfølger til jul på Himmelfjell Hotel. Men som da ikke er en juleroman. Jeg fikk noen applaus her nede. Noen som gleder seg til det, det er bra. Da håper jeg å kunne skrive om sommeren på Himmelfjell Hotel. Riktig. Ja, så bra. Men, Butti, jeg sier jeg er litt usikker på om det blir julroman. Din neste blir da kanskje en sommerroman, men du har ikke slått opp med jul da? Nei, nei, jeg tenker at det kan bli mer jul på Himmelfjell, det kan bli jul andre steder. Det er jo en veldig fin og morsom ting og sjanger å skrive i da. Så jeg tenker vi bare har sett begynnelsen på den juleromanbølgen. Ja, det tror jeg du har helt rett i. Dere nevnte litt egne favoritter og ting dere måtte se, høre, lese bake i sted. Men siden vi nå på en måte har startet juleforberedelsene sammen her i dag, så synes jeg dere skal gi et tips som kanskje ikke er helt opplagt. Noe vi bør få med oss. Bokfront, film, serie, musikk som vi kanskje ikke allerede har på lista vår. Til jul? Oi. Du kan begynne. Jeg ble tatt litt på sengen. Ja, ja, ja. Det som slo meg først med mitt beste tips til jul, men det var jo egentlig bare sånn, det går an å drikke champagne til pinnekjøtt. Det er da et kjempetips. Jeg kan hive meg på den, du kan drikke til ribbe også. Det er ganske sikker på. Vi gikk rett på alkoholen min også. Nei, det var ikke noe annet du hadde... Jeg kommer sikkert på noen fantastiske bøker og sånn jeg burde anbefale etter hvert. Men jeg skal være her hele kvelden, og hvis Kjersti eller Siri kommer med noen gode tips senere, så skal jeg sørge for at Kaplan Damm får lagt ut det på nettet eller noe sånt, når det nærmer seg jul, så vi kan forberede oss godt alle sammen. 
så må vi da sørge for å ikke ha for mye champagne, enten det er til ribbe eller pinnekjøp, da ikke vi får med oss de gode bøkene og filmene og tv-seriene og hva det måtte være. Må kunne oppleve det selv, ja. Siri og Kjersti, tusen takk for en veldig hyggelig førhjulsprat. Takk i like måte. Da gleder jeg meg til fortsettelsen på adventskalenderen og det spennende prosjektet, Siri, som vi ikke vet hva er enda på, men som vi er glad for at det er i gang. Tusen takk skal dere ha. Tusen takk. Ja. Det er som Knut roper bak her, at det går an å kjøpe bøker bak der. Så håper jeg jo de av dere som da enda ikke har lest disse to, nå skjønner at det må dere gjøre. Og vi har til og med fått tillatelse fra forfatterne til å lese dem før desember. Hvis vi vil det, så vet dere det. Og så må jeg minne igjen da om at klokka 19 så er det jo masse spennende som skjer her nede på scenen. Ned en liten trapp bak der. De av dere som allerede har billett, får et bånd på hånden. De av dere som ikke har billett, må gå ut og stille dere i køen. Og vi tror å krysse fingrene for at det blir plass til alle som har lyst til å komme. Så ses vi der om ikke så lenge.